Good morning. I wanted to take you back to that incredible Bobby McFerrin video that started us off today and take a closer look at what might be happening there. And I'm going to spare you my terrible singing, so don't worry. So just to recap quickly, Bobby started by giving the audience two notes. This one, and then by moving a little bit to his left, indicating a higher pitch, this one, right? Then they went back and forth between the two. And then when he jumped a little bit further to his left, indicating a higher pitch, but without singing it, the entire audience landed on this one, right? It was amazing, you saw it. And of course this begs the question, why this pitch? Why not this one, or this one, or any number of higher pitches? I suppose it's possible that everyone in the room that morning had their musical education at the hands of Maria and the Von Trapp family, as in, uh, but that doesn't seem like a totally satisfactory explanation. So back to the video, the audience is now in possession of three notes, two that were given to them, and this one that they had to come up with on their own. Then Bobby jumps to his right and gives them this lower note, and they have a total of four. And from that point on, they're off to the races, right? All he had to do is indicate whether he wanted them to sing higher or lower, but slowly, but surely, they added to their range all of these notes down to here and back up. Right? And they did it together without hesitation as if they'd just come out of rehearsal. It was really incredible. How do we explain that? How do we explain Bobby's comment at the end of the video where he said that this works wherever he tries it? Regardless of culture, regardless of geography, the pentatonic scale, the five note scale, which is what they were singing, one, two, three, four, five, right? Just in two different registers, a lower one and a higher one. The pentatonic scale, he said, just works. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of universal law of nature that would help us explain how someone in New York or in Beijing or in Dubai would complete this musical puzzle and arrive at the same results. Well, it turns out that there is such a thing, a universal acoustic phenomenon that addresses this precise question. It's called the harmonic series or the overtone series. And it works a little bit like this. So tell me what you hear. You might think that all you're hearing is this low and rich and resonant note that we call C, which is produced by its corresponding strings inside the piano vibrating from end to end. And you're right, but you're only partially right. Because as the laws of physics remind us, while that string is vibrating in its entirety, it's also vibrating in two equal parts down the middle and in three equal parts and four quarters and five fifths and so on and so on. And each one of those divisions produces higher and higher tones, overtones. And they occur in a very specific order. And the wonderful thing is that this isn't just true of this beautiful Yamaha piano. It's true of any regularly constructed vibrating body, like the strings on a flute, or uh, sorry, the strings on a violin or a guitar. I'll get to the flute, a vibrating column of air, as in a flute. Every note produced by those instruments, and many others, has embedded within it this very specific preordained series of higher notes completely dictated by nature. So let's try our own experiment and see if I can get you to hear some of these overtones. The first one, as I said, is the result of the string vibrating in two equal parts, and it's going to be the C an octave above the original C. If you go back to Marie and the Von Trapps, you remember that we learned our Right, eight notes of the scale, and every eight notes we have a repetition of C. So what I'm going to do is silently depress the key of this higher C. I'm not playing it, I'm just allowing its strings to vibrate. And listen to what happens when I struck the lower fundamental C. You hear that higher C? One more time. Everybody hear that? Show of hands. Who doesn't hear it? Excellent. Amazing. So the next overtone is the result of the string vibrating in three equal parts. And it's going to be a G now, just five white notes away from that first overtone. So let's repeat the same experiment. The tones get fainter as they go up, but listen closely. 
I silently depress that G and strike the same fundamental one more time. Hear it? Everybody hear it? This one is so clear because it's actually a different note, right? It's no longer a C. Those are the first two words. Now a new note, a G. The next overtone continues this trend of diminishing distances between them. It's now just four white notes up from that G, and it's yet another C. Let's see if you can hear this one. It should be quite faint, but let's try the same experiment. Everybody hear that? It's quite faint, but there, right? And on we go. The next one, just three white notes away, is this E. It's a new note, so now we have three notes with which to play. A C, a G, and an E. The one after that is yet another G, so we're stuck with still just three different pitches. And the next one's interesting. It falls in the cracks, somewhere between A and B flat. Now, there's a long and complicated explanation to why that happens, and it has to do with how modern pianos are tuned. But for today's purposes, just remember that sound wave frequencies aren't limited to the fixed 88 keys of the piano. They can occur anywhere. And so we have our fourth different tone. Let's recap. We have the original G, the C, the G, the E, and now this beautiful kind of bluesy color note that you can either hear as the lower one with a little bit of upper color or the upper one with a little bit of color underneath. The next overtone is another C. So we still have just four with which to play. It's up here. And the fifth new note is the very next one in the overtone series, and it's a D. So to recap again, we have the original C, this G, this E, this beautiful color A, B flat, and this D. Five notes. What happens when I put them all together as closely as possible? You hear that they're all spread out across the piano. So here's the C, the D, the E, the G, and the color A or B flat. Now, I'm going to interpret that color note as the lower A, which is the more common approach. And you guessed it, what we have are the five notes of the pentatonic scale. Embedded in every single note produced by so many of our instruments. Now, as such, the pentatonic is one of the true universals in all of music. You can find it in the folk music of China, And I know you're dying to try this at home, so on your own pianos, it's very easy to find the pentatonic scale. Just play all the black keys. Um, how about as far away as Scotland? Same five notes. Or imagine a pan flute, and now we're in the South American Andes. Or how about African or African-American spirituals? Same pentatonic. Or how about this one? Same five notes again. And this turns out to be one of composers' favorite tools when they try to evoke those cultures. So here's the French composer Debussy trying to conjure up the sounds of a Japanese pagoda. Or how about a little bit closer to home with Jimi Hendrix? Even that one, purely pentatonic. And we could go on all day. I haven't given examples from blues or jazz or Native American music or Greek music. It really seems like it would be easier to find cultures that don't use the pentatonic than ones that do. And I don't know if, like me, you've been following the news in recent years of these ancient cave discoveries across Europe and the very fascinating art that was found in them. Among the artifacts were some prehistoric flutes dating back 30, 40,000 years, made from animal bones. And when those were reconstructed, it turned out that even some of those were turned, tuned to the 
pentatonic scale. So it seems to me that our Paleolithic ancestors have left us a little bit more than just fashionable dieting concepts. Um, they remind us that whether consciously or subconsciously, we've been picking up the notes of the harmonic series for millennia and incorporating into our diverse musical languages to the point where they seem so familiar that a room full of strangers can reproduce them just by watching a man jump on stage. You know, um, musicians get very excited when they talk about the harmonic series because it really does hold so many keys to understanding the way music developed over the course of history. But for me, one of the most important takeaways has to do with listening, with real deep, attentive listening. And I'm not just talking about within the context of music. There's still a lot for us to discover out there if we just choose to listen. Thank you. <laughs>